Hi friends, I'm Max El Hajj. In this episode of the Corpus Animus podcast, I have training think tank coaches Brandon Dorman and Kyle Ruth come on the show and we talk about coaching elite athletes in the sport of CrossFit. If you're on the go and you want to listen to just the audio version, subscribe to the Corpus Animus podcast on your favorite podcast app. Learn more about the art and science of program design for CrossFit in our online educational platform, The Classroom. Get a free seven day trial at trainingthinktank.com backslash classroom trial. Continuously, that the curve is exponential. No, I don't think it, it has. hasn't been. I don't think it can be. Every time. Yeah, I'm not a statistician. Otherwise, I'm, everybody would be I'm dead already. In the last out of Forty this. days, right? Yeah. What I can yeah. do is I can talk about coaching elite athletes, <laughs> yeah. and that is one thing that I do know a little bit about. So, <laughs> and that's what we're covering. And today. that's our topic today. Good segue. Our topic today is going to be uh, just coaching elite athletes, things that we would wish we would have known when we were uh, coaching non elite athletes and trying to transition them into elite athletes and things like that. Uh, so I think Max, having coached the most elite athletes out of all of us, I'm going to let you. In the power start or in the name of positive self-talk, who are you classifying as elite? Because sometimes I call myself. You're not elite. Elite. You coach me. <laughs> you coach <Yeah>. Kyle. <laughs> where's the? Those are not elite athletes, actually. <laughs> where's the threshold start of elite? And when we have that discussion, so I think this is a good place to start. start the conversation. <laughs> I would argue that in our in our sport. Someone is elite if they can qualify for the CrossFit Games from the Open or qualify for the CrossFit Games from a sanctional. That's a very, very small group of very, very so good. So 0.001%. Yeah, that's, that's elite. Okay, cool. Okay, All and right. below that, there's the context. What, what I would say is like just below that, the athletes that can qualify for sanctionals and finish in the top 15 or top 10. Elite-ish. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> probably elite, but they're sometimes they're just getting screwed by the uh, yeah. the testing bias. Yeah, so. the test or you know they just didn't perform well on something. Or, Doesn't mean you're not yeah. a good athlete if yeah. you're a yeah. sanctional qualifier. I, it just I would means, say that if you're in the top. Tenth of one percent, then you're probably elite, which would yeah. be almost every sanctional athlete yeah. too, let's, based on the five hundred thousand. Yeah, let's say like compete. top ten in a sanctional type thing. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's hard. All right. First and foremost, when you're coaching athletes at that level, they're still just humans. Yeah. Like having, I remember before I had coached anyone that could achieve at that level, I would always like dream of coaching an elite athlete, like a games athlete. But I always thought, like, man, the, the training's gonna look so different than what I'm used to giving people. And the reality is the training doesn't look that different. And also, like, the training cycles that led to people achieving that standard weren't really any different than what they'd been doing before. It was never something where I was like, man, they're going through this training cycle and they're, di Josh, yeah. last year at French Throwdown, I'm, I was not like, man, Josh, Josh Miller. yeah, Josh is absolutely <laughs> crushing this. We're, he's gonna go to the games. He was just Josh training. <laughs> He's, he's just training, and he's just training well, yeah. you know, just as well as he always had. And then it was when he was out there and competing at French Throwdown where I was watching, and I was like, oh, my God. He's, like, he's crushing some of the fittest athletes on, on earth right now. Like, something we did worked. But if you go back and look at the training, it doesn't look any different than it did before Mac, where he finished 10th, or before yeah. you just know, good the tests, Open, where he or, didn't qualify for regionals yeah. the year before. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of being an elite from having worked with them is not this unbreakable self-confidence that you would actually, like that you perceive of when you, like even watching the Michael Jordan documentary, you're like, you know, watching it and you're like, oh, this guy's got an unshakable belief that he's gonna be the greatest. And yeah, that might exist in a couple very isolated people, but at the broad level, they're still, carrying insecurities about little things, about the way they look, they doubt that they could do it, they feel pre-competition anxiety. <clears throat> I think the, I mean, I'd say Trav and Noah are obviously the two most notable people I coach that are in our media and, and Will um, and Lucas, like all of them, they have <clears throat> some level of that self-belief that is a requirement of being good. But I think really one of the key variables that gets left out is just the consistent application of work to the craft, right? Like people don't think like, okay, Travis does some really cool shit. He's been training CrossFit continuously in high volume without any prolonged breaks or any injuries for almost a decade. Is he, so, he might be approaching 12 years at this point. Uh, he was, yeah, he, yeah, I know he did the, he did the open in 2011. I know for sure, because that's the year I made it to regionals and I beat him. So <laughs> yeah. he's never heard this story ten. before. Never heard Is that like story. you do the first time? Yeah. Damn it, that's about the story. 
<laughs> That's my highlight <laughs> of my life. <laughs> yeah. You bring that up to him at least every single year. Yeah, well, I have to. I have to do something to try something to, keep to motivate his, him, yeah, right? To keep his because ego it turns in check. out when you're working with elite athletes, it's not like they show up with a wellspring of, of motivation every single day to train. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and I don't know. For me, at this point, it's different because, like, these guys are my friends. Like I've been coaching them for so long and talking. She, like the veil of professionalism has been blended, where it's like, all right, you know, you guys are. Travis has three kids. It's not like you know he's this young who's like, I want to make the games, which is how he started, right? Like he had this pie in the sky type dream, and now it's like, oh, this is your profession, and like I'm your friend and your colleague because like your success is my success and we're kind of interwoven. So the process has definitely evolved over time. But from a principal perspective, I feel like the thing that's most notable to me when looking at them <clears throat> is they're like cockroach cockroaches. They tolerate to so much training volume. They might not, like Brandon's aerobic capacity it, and, or Will's aerobic capacity and his and the skill sets that Will has is just as good. The only difference is like they were able to keep doing it for years and years and years and be in the arena without getting hurt or broken. So I feel like it's just, if you wanna be elite elite at that level, you gotta have the goods on the inside and you also gotta get, have a little bit of luck and you have to have some resilience. And I'm not sure that it's one of the things I have a really hard time with because as a coach, I wanna be like, hey, my principles help. They help with longevity. They, it's one of the reasons why these guys are at the top. But in reality, I don't even know if that's true. It's just that like, they might have the goods and the cream would have risen no matter what, no matter what they were doing. And that's a hard realization to share and be like, well, I coach them, so you should be part of the organization. So I feel like, Really, you shouldn't be saying that any of your protocols are good because you produce the best. Well, I think that's it's what I was rest. getting at. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's exactly what I was getting at. Is that you know, it, for the athletes that I have had, you know, breakthrough <clears throat> to the to the next level, go from, hey, I'm qualifying for regionals, which became sanctionals, and now I've qualified for the games or qualifying for the games out of the open. It was there was no thing, there was no moment where it was like, oh man, this was the difference. It was like they were just training. They were training hard and training consistently, and we were fighting to keep them healthy, and we were fighting to keep them motivated, and fighting to keep them, you know, engaged in, in what they were doing, and just focused on, all right, your biggest weakness is still your strength, or, or in Cedric's case, your biggest weakness is still your wall ball, right? Like, we're still working on the, the fundamentals in the sport and just building those and building those and building those over time, and then all of a sudden, it all, like you said, the, the cream rises to the top, and then boom, now they've yeah. achieved some standard that everyone looks at and they're like, oh, that's elite. Yeah, yeah I think two things, not to cut you no, off, no, it's kind of two things that I, I take from what both of you guys are saying. One, it, in, in this sport, it's gonna change over time and the 10,000 hour rule will probably be true at some point as yeah. we get deeper into like, yeah. you know, a 20 year sport and then a 30 year sport, but it does take time. And so like for those that are watching and wondering like, well, how can I become elite? Some people are just better than others and that's just the nature of the game. But I do think like you look at how hard Josh has worked or how, I remember watching Noah the first year that he ever made regionals and how, I mean, he was talented then, but how much better he has become. And that's kind of what has defined him over the course of the last eight years or however much it's been. And then thinking about Travis, John actually sent a picture out the other day of him on a bike out in Utah. And he was just like this scrawny little dude, just yeah. working hard, trying yeah. to you know reach the goal. Yeah. So I think that takes some time. And then you know the other thing, you just mentioned this is like, all right, what are your weaknesses? So one of the things you still have to do with the best in the sport is identify those limitations. And then how do we get you better compared to the field? And to that point, there's always a new thing that is your biggest weakness because when you take the thing that was your old weakness and you make it a strength, well now something else drops below and that has to be developed. And the sport is constantly moving forward because it's such a young sport yeah. at like 3%, 5% per year. It's constantly evolving. And so the things that were your strengths, like you were a 220 cal you know, 10 minute max calorie assault bike. Well, that was great two years ago. Now 220 is just like 50 people in the sport that can qualify for a sanctional that are at that level. Now you've got to, if you want to be the, the yeah, so top Yeah, so now if top, it comes up and you have to do it at the field and you get tested, you can wait to get exposed or you could pre-prepare and train to make sure you have that system developed just in case it comes up. And in the process of doing that, that impacts strength. Like it's just a, it's really a juggling act at that point because you're trying to figure out how much can they tolerate? How much do they want to tolerate? What are they motivated to do? What's going on in the world? So like Travis, 
Travis has dealt with a lot of burnout, and I think more so because of the nature of the chaos and the change and the games changing and the games changing format. And like, it's different when you're planning, when you have three kids to take care of and a business, right? Like you're like, well, is my income stream gonna stay steady? When am I gonna compete? Where's the money gonna come from? So you have to have a like kind of a practical um, approach to the game. So Travis will go through these lulls where he's like, well, I got nothing to train for. And then it's like, okay, we we're training for West Coast Classic. And West Coast Classic announced that they were doing all repeats. And I was like, oh shit, this could be really good or this could be really bad. Cause he's about to test stuff that he's tested in a competitive headspace. And he comes out and he smashed everything that he's ever done before. And I think some of it for him is just the the leading belief, up to yeah, in practice leading up to West Coast Classic, which was like I mean, right by like minutes too on a couple workouts, right? Rushing yeah, it was them. insane. And I really think some of it was just that he refused to believe that the years of training that he put up since that test hadn't made him more fit. So well, like, I remember they watching, probably had. Yeah, they as tested by CrossFit, like the years sure. of training. That's one of the things I think. If you rewind five years ago when I was working with athletes who were trying to make the trans, most of the athletes I worked with then were trying to make the transition from like good open to a regional athlete, yeah. right? Not at the same level with the athletes I'm working with now. But if you had said like, what's the difference between these guys? I think it's essentially that Travis has spent 10 years now training and like all of these guys, Cedric, yeah. even though he's 23 years old, has been involved in CrossFit for like eight years. Yeah. That's an eight year process of getting close and missing, getting close and missing. Josh, before the first time he qualified, had been f fifth at a regional before, had qualified for multiple sanctionals and fallen short. Like the process of getting there is a long process and it takes eight years, 10 years, 10,000 hours. It takes that amount of time to really get yourself transitioned from like, oh, I can make it, I can qualify for this sanctional thing and then maybe I'll get lucky to the point where Travis is where like, it doesn't really matter what comes out. The likelihood that he does make it is extremely high. Yeah. That takes years and years and years of accumulated work. I want to steer this in a couple of different directions, yeah, if you don't on. mind. So the, the first one is I want to get down to kind of like the nuts and bolts of like how you guys look at an elite training program and what you do based on the data that we have. Right. So one of the things that we've done a good job of, I think, is outside of like the, the science of physiology and, and the way that the body adapts is also the, the science of analytics, right? Yeah. Like taking the data that we know that we've seen in the sport and then picking out and choosing what is tested most, what we need to make sure they work on, look at what the highest correlators are to winning in different sanctionals or at the games. So how do you guys look at that kind of data or do you look at that kind of data? Well, so I used to just be a leaderboard scoundrel. Like I would, a scoundrel might not be the word, scavenger. <laughs> I go into the You league. are scoundrel. <laughs> 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 I'd go into the leaderboard and like, so Noah's first discussion that we had um, was right after his 2016 games, which he would, he went eighth, eighth, and then 16th, I think was his worst finish. And then we started. We and were there watching that. Yeah, and and I felt yeah. so bad for him that yeah. year. Um, so I sat down and I just like, all right, let's just mathematically go through the leaderboard and then try to see on your weaknesses, I would try to tie it to like, what's the training adaptation that leads you to not be good at this style of test? <clears throat> and then I would go through that analysis and be like, okay, well, this is what I think you need to work on, which often was in conflict with what the athlete wants to work on. Like Noah was always, I need to get stronger, I need to get stronger, I need to get stronger, because that's the thing that held him back when he was earlier in his career. And then I go through the tests and I'm like, well, if you really look at the test, that's not the thing that's holding you back. It's like the heavy-ish stuff when you have to do it under fatigue, the longer range running, the cyclical stuff, the strongman, like all of that stuff seems to be a bigger priority to me from a quantifiable perspective. That changed a lot when you and Becky built out that stats page. I think we've, we've done a classroom continuing education piece on it and written a blog on it. And I think understanding, well, what's the volume tolerance that people have to have on the basic movements of CrossFit? What has been tested before has really just governed me making sure that when I write a training program, so like right now, 
<clears throat> I'm writing Travis and Noah's training program, and I'm writing it with the understanding that they're going to the games. There's the understanding that the COVID situation is going on. So like Noah has some responsibilities to do at home stuff. So he doesn't want to do too much cyclical work. So there's all these variables that go into place. And as I do it, there's a practical side of it. It's like, all right, well, I want them to compete every once in a while, but not too much so that they get burnt out. I want those tests to be kind of balanced between them. But I also have to take into consideration as I'm writing this chaotic distribution of training and I'm making some progressions on their strength training, that the chaos, when I map it out over the course of a week, is touching the level of volume on the skills that they need to have polished that are definitely coming out. So that has helped me come up with a categorization system using the Brandon, Brandon statistics, laying it out on basically the right-hand side of my, my weekly templates, and basically highlighting like, oh, I've done muscle-ups this week, what's the volume? Cool, that's good enough, I can check it off the list. And I use it for them at the elite level more so as a checklist that I'm doing what's required for like the most important thing. So like, so I think that's a good point. So one of the things that I've done recently is I've taken athletes who haven't qualified and got them qualified. And I think the subset of skills and the subset of movements that you need to train in order to take someone from not qualifying to qualifying is different than what you need to do when you have someone who they've already developed most of those skills yeah. to a really high degree. So what you're saying real quick is just like someone that has to qualify in the open or just or like- Or qualify through a sanctional who's never yeah. done it before. Like so they the, don't- you're saying the movement selection is different in the yes. open versus the games. That's what and you're so trying to say. for them, their season gets much more biased based on what's coming up. So like Cedric, for example, he is already qualified for the games. He qualified through the open. So he, you know, we are assuming that it might be at a Romus or something like this. So running is a priority. And you know, some of the yeah. like more outdoor uh, game style stuff is a priority for him. But for everybody else, you know, the season has basically been completely reconfigured and now the open is the where next you target. To, yeah, it's yeah. the next target. Yeah, and so no for them, you know, we, we have the distribution of all the movements that need to be hit. And for some of them, some of those movements are still weaknesses for them. So I almost have those instead of in a chaotic pattern, I'm almost progressing those linearly, like using yeah. really basic linear progressions not necessarily volume progressions, because most of those athletes at this point are already volume tolerant enough to yeah. do 120 yeah. chest to bar. And they and already workout. move pretty well. Like it's, now it's, it's just about a, getting them to very, do it faster. Yeah, right? it's, it's such a different game at that level that it's almost non-practical to talk about for people other than the themes of what those people do. But a lot of it is in the assessment for me. Yeah. It's like, what what are you doing? Where's your headspace? What do you want to work on? What do you like doing? Like plays a big role. I mean, I, if I, I had my way, Noah would be doing hard assault bike rowing and loaded running work every day until he was good <laughs> enough. But if I did that with him, he'd probably fire me as a coach. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. 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 I'm done. I want to do, you know, 20 minute normal general CrossFit stuff. Like, so there's a balance, right? There's a give and take of understanding like, yeah, there's a human element to this and there's a, there's a, an amount of shitty stress that people are willing to take, no matter what the level is. Like people say, like, I'll do anything to win. I'm like, yeah, you say that until like every day of your waking life is miserable and you're not enjoying what you're doing. <laughs> like that happens to people if you're doing hard shit all the time. So it's a it's an interesting process where I think it's the assessment for me is where I use that data and integrate it into the weekly structures. Well, you said a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily applicable to everybody, right? And I think you I think you're right in in the sense that like you can't look at what Noah is doing and say, all right, I'm just gonna jump into this program and expect that I'm gonna get better. Cause there were so many steps that he took yeah. from the time I think he was 18 or 17 all the way up until, you know, now he's 28, 29 yeah. and competing. Like there were a lot of steps to get to the point that he's able to tolerate what he's doing now. But I look at it and it's like, okay, how do you take someone from good in the sport to being able to qualify for, for a sanctional? Well, first off, to qualify for most sanctionals, you have to be really good in a qualifier or the open. So the first thing you have to do is get volume tolerant for all the movements in the open. Then you have to be able to do them fast enough to be competitive. And thanks to Brandon, we have a lot of that data. We yeah. have the information like, what's the movement speed that's required for most of the movements in, in the sport? So first get volume tolerant, then get fast enough. Make sure that you can qualify. There's no sense in like prioritizing running and swimming and sandbag and strongman work if you can't qualify for the next level, for the sanctional level. And then once you have someone who can pretty much consistently qualify, then you start to, to change the priorities there and build volume tolerance in strongman movements, build volume tolerance in running, build volume tolerance in concept two bikes and assault bikes. Because the reality is 
those things aren't tested in qualifiers. Yeah. Yeah. So there's not a lot of sense in training for those things. Yeah, I usually use like a football analogy just because I played it my whole life. So like, you know, and this is where I kind of got into the, the data and the analytics of the sport because like, so when we prepped for a game and I played on offense, we would look at the, the team that we were playing, their defense, and we said, okay, they played cover two, which basically for people that don't know, just like two safeties over, over top of the field. And we know that the middle of the field's wide open and the outsides of the field, the corner routes are gonna be wide open. Those are the cover two beaters is what we call them. So so then we'd write down any time that they had this look, here are the three plays that we'd run. And then if they played cover one, here's the three plays that we'd run, so on and so forth. Basically, we were studying the film so much that we knew exactly when they came out, we knew exactly what we were gonna run. The same thing in the sport, that we can see what has come out in the sport and then start preparing for it. But if a team doesn't play cover two, I'm not gonna have my cover two beaters. So if I don't have sandbags in a qualifier, Yes, that may be a good training tool long term just to create some longevity and development for the sport. But if we know that the, the biggest limitation is toes to bar, or some kind of compression or pulling off the ground, we were just talking about power snatches before we got on air. Those are the things that you probably should prioritize if you're playing that team, which is the open. Yeah, right? I think you have to be OK with saying with understanding that the philosophies of CrossFit, which I largely agree with general physical preparedness, develop of energy systems that go from short to long, and the 10 general skills as a model for physical development is a really good model. I like it, I've used it, I have, I actually think I try to embody it in my own training with some of the stuff that I do outside of here. But when you're playing a sport, the sport of CrossFit, even though they say, okay, we're gonna go unknown and unknowable, if you look through all of the chaotic stuff that has come out, that has all been a surprise to us, right? Like yeah. there was years at regionals that came out and the I was like- The dumbbell year? Yeah, like, wait, like, wait, 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 yeah. wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> but if you look back over the course of the decade of the sport, the patterns are still there. Like you have to be, you have to be good at certain things. You have to be good at hanging from a bar and doing toes to bar, bar muscle ups, chest to bar pull ups in super high volume. You have to be good at every variation of burpees. You have to be good at plyometrics for double unders and box jumps. You have to be good at barbell cycling at all loads from 75 weight. pound yeah. snatches all the way up to 265 pound snatches. And be able snatches. to do heavy reps either under pressure or under massive levels of fatigue. So there's patterns of like, all right, from a sport perspective, this is what the base level fundamental stuff that you have to develop is. And in, when that's good, I feel like the next discussion is, all right, now we're dealing with elite athletes and that's the pyramid and the sharpening. And it's very hard to create principles for that, right? Even if you just look at the athletes, like Brent Fikowski is six foot one, 215, I'm just guessing on that, but somewhere around that. And then Frazier's like five foot six, 200 pounds, which is a completely distribution, different distribution of muscle mass and anthropometrics. If they had the same exact training program, that would be so silly. But there's definitely gonna be themes in there of the fundamentals, and I think that is what we try to do as coaches. Like I look at Travis being 5'10 and 200 pounds, and Noah being 5'7 and 190 or 188. They have different needs, different strengths and weaknesses, and the principles are like all the data that we look at for the qualifiers is like, yeah, that stuff has to be similar. But once you get past that, it's like, all right, now it needs to be done on an individual basis based on where your head yeah, space is, your example, next competition. How much, how much running is Travis doing relative to how much running yeah, Noah's doing, less. right? Yeah, um, that's, although that might change right now. That's yeah. a basic training principle. So you said there's no training principles, but the, the basic training principle that holds from you know, your, your person who just walks into the gym all the way up to the elite level is that individualization has value, that yeah. there's value in assessing the athlete, if it's an athlete, relative to the sport, right? Not just assessing the athlete, oh, you're strong, yeah. et cetera, or et cetera, but assessing limiter, them yeah. relative to the metrics in the sport and then building their training based upon their assessment. Yeah. Like that's the fundamental. Yeah. That can you can play the averages the for someone that's coming up in the sport, right? Like you yeah. have to do that a little bit. You gotta know what's being tested and like hedging your bets a little bit and saying, hey, these are the things that have been tested most often. We wanna prep you for the open. But like you're saying, as you get someone better, then obviously you have to even, you, you circle in those limitations even more if it's fifth place to second place at the games yeah. or qualifying from a sanctional to the games. It's like, this is what's holding you back. And obviously you have to individualize that. Yeah. It's like, a, I don't know, if I look at it as like a level of granularity. So it's like, at First, it's like strength is like, are you strong? Are you powerful? Are you weak? Does it need to get better? Cool. Then like, all right, we prioritize strength 
for you or energy systems. It's like, all right, I'm a good sprinter, but I'm not going good at going long. So it's like, all right, well, you got to work on your engine and getting long. It's like, then there's sport specific skills. Can you do double unders? Can you do muscle ups? As you keep getting better, the level of granularity and the focus on yeah, those things. Then it things, goes from can like, you do double unders to how many can you do unbroken? Yeah. Then the layer above that is how quickly can yeah. you do yeah. 100 can unbroken? Can you do 130 per minute? Or can you do them at 130 beats per minute cadence while you're under fatigue and you got blood yeah. pumped in your Well, then forearms. it's a combo of movements, right? Yeah. Can you do that same thing paired Then it goes to can you do push-ups. triple threes well? Yeah. And can you also do like the heavy double under rope climb from, from Mayhem Classic, right? Yeah. Where those are two completely... Someone might be good at double unders in triple threes and be terrible at heavy double unders with a with rope climbs. Like those yeah, might be yeah. completely different. Well, so this is where I think we can take it all the way back to the start where you guys were talking about like you know years in the sport allow you to get better. Not just like with you know like you're get, creating some like physiological adaptations. Yeah. It's like the psychological stuff helps, right? Yeah. Travis believes that he's better than he was, but then also just the experience of the sport. And I think this is really what makes an elite athlete. The more experience you get under the lights or on the field with all the pressure, you find ways to compete at a higher level. Yeah. And that's what made Rich Froning so much better. He failed one year, he came back, and obviously there's probably some other things that helped him, but those are the things I think that really make the best of the best. Well, yeah. along those same lines, there's a lot of, I work with a lot of younger, really good competitors, and one of the first conversations I have with them is that like, look, this is going to be a long process. You're not going to show up to your first sanctional and all of a sudden be on the podium. Like it's just not gonna happen. Realistically, this is gonna take you two or three years of competing at sanctionals. At first, you're gonna end up on the bottom of the heap. Yeah. First time you show up, you're probably gonna get 35th yeah. out of 36. Yeah. Can you right? say that that happens? People still have those aspirations because that is what happened 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you could walk into yes. the arena and you would, and if you were good enough, you'd be in the top 10. But right now, even if you have all the skills, most likely you're gonna be in that last heat at a sanctional yeah. if you qualify. Yeah, I mean, I think, I do think that the skill sets are just a little too broad. So you might get somebody that's new that could come in that can do like three or four things at an elite level like that. Like they might be strong enough or they might be good at like body weight engine based stuff. But I think the skill sets under pressure, under fatigue, multiple test date, like yeah. back to back on the same day, I find it very hard to believe unless it's an anomaly type situation. Like yeah, you, there will always next, be a, someone yeah, to the break next them Matt Frazier to come out or the next Rich Froning or the next Tia. Like there might be somebody out there, but I think even if you're elite, you probably should plan that. I know like Tanner Blaz that I have helped with and follows the design, his training program. He like had a pretty good successful first year in the open. Then his second year in the open, he got exposed with movement standard stuff. He went down to Wadapalooza as part of one of our teams. And he had like a pretty profound failure type event in the overhead lunge, um, like, on the assault bike and he's a very prideful young guy because he's like i believe i can be great i want to be great i have some of the skill sets to be great i've done it in he some came of the here stages during one of our elite camps and did fantastic yeah, and for sure he's definitely got the talent but he had that moment and my first thought was good he needed that he needed that adversity to to become more humble and to realize what the elite athletes that have done it for like five consecutive regionals and been to five consecutive games, that they're not just doing that in training on a day-to-day -day basis. They're doing it under pressure, under the lights, with a varied subset of skills, and they've all failed and experienced that. And like, they don't wallow in it. They don't like let that, they almost use that as motivation to get themselves better and reinforce their skills. So like afterwards when I said it, I'm like, look, it's over, man. This is day one or it was day two of the competition. I'm like, you can think about it more now and beat yourself up over it or use it as fuel to finish the, you know, the weekend on strong. And I think that's the type of mentality that elites need to have is understanding that well, the failure process is going to be very, very profound and frequent when you're young. Not only that, but for the young guys that are coming up in the sport, you're going to have to keep trying yeah. over and over and over. I realized now, had the, the COVID situation not happened, one of the realizations I came to was one of the most successful strategies for qualifying for the games for younger athletes is to do all the qualifiers and Everything. try and qualify for every sanctional and go to every single one because it just simply increases your chances of getting a subset of workouts at a sanctional that's good for you. Yeah. That is your best chance and at qualifying. And practice. Like yeah, I, that's the yeah, big one, I like think. Yeah, like Noah competed all the time and 
this might be a mistake in how I approach Travis's, like we made these decisions together, but it was like, hey, you wanna be one of the best, these skill sets need to be dialed in, let's dial these skill sets so that when you go out, you can win. What I didn't really take into consideration is not practicing winning and not practicing competing was potentially holding back his ability on game day to express that like next gear. Whereas Noah had the opposite approach. He might not have had the level of detail or the training progressions that I would have recommended at that time, but he was competing all the time. He was getting really good at the skill at, of competing. At competing. And so it I, built his confidence a ton too. I yeah, think that, that's for sure. huge yeah, help. I mean, you become callous. You become right. callous to the anxiety now, before I will like, say to play devil's advocate to that, during the regional era, I think I think that that was a decent strategy, right? Yeah, like take, for sure. Taking the strategy of like, all right, let's spend most of this year, you do one, maybe two competitions yeah. in the off season at most, and spend the year preparing for regionals, because Tra Travis knew he was yeah, gonna yeah. qualify for yeah. regionals. And like, because you get one shot one to attempt, qualify for yeah. the games. And now that's completely different. You need to go out and develop the skill of competing in a live environment. Yeah. That's actually why we do the throwdown workouts on sites, help people with that like qualifier style feel of like, here's a workout, here's a demo, here's what people can do on it. Go out there and actually practice that skill set, like getting a random workout, do it, go as fast as you possibly can, review it, maybe even redo it. Like that whole thing is a process. The Open started it, but with the COVID situation, it could be the future of the sport for the next I don't know, year and a half, like maybe not that long, but it's definitely something that I think people need to take into consideration as the first tier of development. Yeah, Elite I mean, athletes, I mean, I feel like Travis and Noah love qualifiers and they're really good at them, but right. you have to at that level. For, for those like what, who Kyle is talking about, right? Those that are trying to get into the high level sanctional position or make the games though that maybe aren't in their place, they have to have that experience, not only for like, let's get the right subset of tests because that's definitely true now with the 20 plus sanctionals we have, but the other thing too is the experience of failure that allows the coach and the athlete to have that discussion of these are things obviously we need to work on. You're good at it maybe in uh, in your own environment, but what happened when the rope was a little bit slicker, the bar was a little bit slicker, the the jump rope <laughs> was a little bit heavier. Yeah. Yeah. All I can think yeah. of yeah. all the athletes I had competed at Filthy 150 with the wet climbing yeah. ropes. <laughs> <laughs> Every single one of them was like, my rope was so wet I couldn't hold on. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. rope was wet. <laughs> right. But those are the things that maybe you don't experience, or if even if you do have, like I hear people all the time, they go to competition, they're like, the rings were really long. I'm used to having these short rings, and it's like then you start to like, okay, maybe we should start practicing on longer rings, or maybe we should start practicing outside if it's gonna be an outside rig, or whatever it may be. It gives you those opportunities to have a discussion with your athletes, or the athletes to also have a realization, like Tanner, like that's something that I need to make sure that I'm working on. Yeah, it's a, an important thing, I think, to realize. I've noticed it more now as people, you get removed from your environment. So for me, the fire that I was getting competitively was in this facility. There was super loud music playing, put in these new lights that are like extra bright that almost like turn my nervous system, like ramp it up because I'm, yeah, I'm used to the darkness. Funny that uh, Max noticed that, I didn't notice yeah, that. Oh man, it like made my eyes burn. I'm used to like having all the lights <laughs> yeah. dimmed in my house. It was like a I'm, dungeon yeah, in here before though. <laughs> yeah, um, but you remove that environment, you remove my the competitive sphere, remove training partners, and I was like, huh, it's really different to try to go as hard as I possibly can. So that has been a realization that most people have had and, and expressed to me. Now take that same thing and magnify it for a competition. Now you warm up, you get ready to go, and now it's like, all right, stand in this corner for 20 minutes and then go out and lift 90% of your one rep max under pressure with 3,000 people watching you after you just cooled all the way down. That's a skill that is, the more you do it, the more you develop self-belief that like, it doesn't matter, right? Like, oh, Travis is in a corral waiting for 30 minutes. It's like, yeah, well, he's all done it 35 times. The thought that's going through his head is not, oh, I, I might miss this lift because I didn't warm up right. So Travis is in the corral thinking, all right, I've been here before. I'm just kind of yeah. sit around. Maybe I'll do a couple squats. Next to him is the, you know, the 22-year-old who just qualified for their first sanctional. They had a really good first day, so they're in the top heat next to Travis. Going through their head is like, man, this is a really long time to be in this corral. My legs are, my legs don't, my legs feel off. They're yeah. dead. My yeah. back is tired. tired. That's, yeah. Travis, yeah. that's yeah. Travis Manor right yeah. next to him. Like, <laughs> completely <me>. different. <laughs> <And you're, laughs> but the reality is they have to go out there and they have to do it over and over yeah. and over to build that same level of confidence that Travis has to just stand in the corral and be like, 
All right, yeah. I'll get hyped up when I go out there to lift. Yeah, so I think that is probably the thing that is the biggest separator in elites more so than the training volume or the training experience. structure is just, yeah, and, and the willingness to be vulnerable and go gain experience. Like, I think I actually, you know, they say you're a sum of the people that you hang around, and I think- You're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> <For sure. laughs> the, uh, the coaching the elites actually shifted my own mentality with regards to like safety or like training myself. It was like, oh, if I wanna be good at doing this, or like I wanna jump in, even like, for me, it's like this small little throwdown competitive culture is way different than being on a stage. So I'm not comparing it, but it's my form of my outlet of doing it right now. So it's like, all right, if I want to be good at that, I got to put myself in there. Like, doesn't matter if the tests are hard for me. It doesn't matter if I'm going to take last place on the leaderboard and embarrass myself in front of my own culture. Like, whatever it is, you just got to do it, no matter what that feeling is. And after doing it enough times, I was like, oh, like, you become callous to it and it actually makes you better. Like, it actually, the process of putting yourself into that gross level of vulnerability and anxiety actually pulls more juice out of you. And I think those guys are doing it at such a bigger magnified level because there's thousands of eyes around you. So it's almost like the reward for your work ethic gives you that opportunity and that opportunity actually helps you eclipse to another level of performance. And they say like, you know, Michael Jordan is made for the big stage. Tiger Woods is made for the big stage. Noah as a trainee, everyone knows. And like now that his name Names on our design leaderboard every week, like people realize, is like, oh, he's not that impressive in training on a day to day. Like he even said to me, he's like, it's kind of interesting seeing, like, you know, I'm not used to like I do a training session and four or five people beat me on it because I'm training in an environment where I'm beating everyone. He's also in a different environment than he was a couple of years ago because Training Think Tank has more good athletes yeah. for in, sure yeah, on, yeah. on the leaderboard yeah. in general. For I mean, sure. a couple I, when when I had all those guys here before for that training camp, the elite training camp leading into Brazil and, and Wadapalooza, one of the first things I said to him was like, don't come here with the goal of winning every single one of these workouts because <laughs> yeah. you are going to get your faces smashed. On something. There's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you just can't win everything that yeah. you do in here with this group of people. Yeah. It's not the same as it was three years ago where it was either Noah or Travis are gonna win everything. Like the level of the sport especially for yeah. some of the younger athletes, is rising. Yeah. And they're hungry to make it happen. Yeah. And they well, want to beat those yeah, guys yeah. really badly. Yeah. More <laughs> than, and that's the thing, is like for Noah, that year, that next year, maybe it comes out in competition because of all the eyes and all the pressure and all the fans, or maybe it's just that he cares more about performing well there than he does on a day-to-day -day basis in training, which well, is another thing to take into consideration. You say that because, like, you know, I mean, he puts up amazing scores even in the training yeah. that he did on the design, but then he just, he, we did the quarantine classic and he beat everybody by three minutes on workouts. Yeah. Like, and actually posted his videos and, like, yeah. legitimate full range of motion every single rep and just crushes people. Yeah. Whereas the week before, maybe five people beat him on a workout. It's yeah. like, no, it's a totally different level. I, I think the thing that people need to remember is like, it's not isolated to our sport. Like the, every rookie in the NFL or at the NBA level, golf, swimming, yeah. like people have to go through kind of the bumps in the road. To, some people are just great yeah, yeah. all around, right? Most of us have to go through those bumps and have like a down rookie year. And then people are like, oh no, maybe that was a bad pick. And then the next year they, they have a great year. It's like, they, you gotta get used to it. And so I think that goes back to your point of like, just throw them out there into the fire and, and let them kind of rise to the occasion. Yeah. And fight, can, fight, 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 yeah. try and qualify, do yeah. what you can. Yeah. And yeah. compete as regularly as you can in a competitive pool that makes sense. I think like in hindsight, like I don't obviously coach that many people anymore because I have like my little elite crew and then the online program, the design is pretty much like that's my current coaching body. But if I were to take on younger athletes, especially ones that are prideful and ready to go, a lot of them would be like, I'm gonna try to qualify for Wadapalooza Elite. And then you don't, and you don't go. And I'm like, no, go RX. That's where you qualify, that's where your current or, fitness man, level is. You don't know how qualify. many conversations yeah. I've had that are exactly yeah. like that. And you if, are missing an opportunity to get better by yeah. not going and down there. And if you think you're better than the RX division, then go out and crush everyone, yeah. which is <laughs> unlikely. Yeah, not yeah. to mention there are really good guys and girls. <laughs> There's a difference between proving it and believing it. Yeah. Most, most of them believe that they're above the RX level, and then they would go out there, and all the other people who also believed that they were above the RX level are gonna be out there competing with them. Like, this is a pretty big pond, and yeah. no fish is above any level. But I think to that same point, like those those younger guys, they are, 
extremely hungry to compete at events like Wadapalooza. But the reality is if, if you're trying to go to your first sanctional as your coach, I would probably advise against using Wadapalooza as that first opportunity and choose a different sanctional with a different set of stages because it's a huge stage. Yeah. There are thousands of people in the crowd. Yeah. There are bright lights. The event, like the overall event programming and volume is just higher than it is at other events. Well, and also the money is gonna attract a better competitive field. Absolutely. So you're almost guaranteed, like, there's probably not some random new up and comer that's going and beating Vellner on a bunch of tests at or Noah at a bunch of these competitions. You're yeah. better off yet, yeah, but you're better off going to somewhere where it's like, oh, you got one or two superstars, and then the rest of the field is really good athletes, but you have a shot to actually win some stuff and build some confidence versus going and taking last place in the best field. I don't know. I almost feel like you're better off being able to like cherry pick and go and win some stuff and build confidence and have some of those times where you're competing against people that are either like your peers or under you versus saying, I want to be elite, so I'm going to go and compete against the elites. Like I said, take the steps. You can't look at what the elites are doing right now and just try and mimic exactly what they're doing and expect to be yeah, there. That's a right? recipe, I think, for uh, early burnout. Yeah, a lot of burnout, a lot of injury. I know that's a pretty common thing that people do, but I feel like if you do do that, you should have some individual guidance to go through that process intelligently so you could have either have some stuff that's built just for you or that you're knowing when you need to tailor things up and back because like I like with Travis and with Noah they have put in so many years so like we did a workout in the design that was it was an interval structure that was just to build chest to bar volume and it was like um, certain or chest to bar pull-ups AMRAP in one minute with a cap of 40, rest three minutes on the skier and repeat that three times. And Noah did 40 unbroken, 40 unbroken, and then just decided to go for a bigger set to build some volume and then did 59. So he did 40, 40, 59 <laughs> over the with, course. With skier in between. With skier, yeah, with skier in, between. <laughs> in between in less than a 10 minute window to build that type of volume tolerance to wake up the next day and not be crippled in the lats and the biceps took years. Or he did 240 pistols in his Gary throwdown yeah, workout. In 15 minutes. In 15 minutes with of all movements. the muscle yep. with 60 bar muscle ups and 90 chest to bar pull ups is like that level of volume tolerance. Yeah, you could probably take a young gifted athlete and get them up there that quickly, but you'd be better off building it slowly and allowing the consistency to get you up there so that way you can refine your technique and not get as sore and have better training consistency over time and take a little bit more of an intelligent patient approach, which I don't think a lot of people do. They try to chase the elite too soon. One more point there. It's not like Noah is doing that volume of chest bar pull-ups or that volume of pistols all the time. Right, so he yeah. also does, if, if you're preparing for the games, you're going to start bringing volume of movements up over yeah, time. For sure. So it's not like he's constantly maintaining the readiness in order to be able to do, what do you say, 260 pistols yeah. or whatever. He's not, that is not maintained year round. Yeah. There is, are some training camps in CrossFit that do maintain it year round. For sure. But for sure. just not how we approach things. And I don't think, I think there would be more people in that environment that would break and not progress than would create cream of the crop type athletes. Well, that's but, why you don't see just hundreds and hundreds of new people every single year yeah. make it, right? Yeah. Like it's, it, there are new people, but most of the same names come up. It's yeah. because they are training somewhat intelligently or they're just very resilient. Yeah. I think the, the era of the current cream of the crop is nearing the end. For sure. For sure. I mean, most of them are in their late early, 20s, early, early 30s. 30s and I, I think we're yeah. within a, a, a span of time where you're gonna see a new generation of athletes, but it's not gonna all of a sudden be like the 30 year olds are out yeah. and the young guys yeah. are in. It's, it's gonna be, like be a one slow. guy or girl retires and yep. one comes up. I mean, it's I mean, already happened yeah. before. Yeah. Adams yeah. is kind of doing it on the female yeah. side. Yeah. But we've seen this like, you know, both male and female side, you know, seven years ago, yeah. there were different names at the top. Matt and they Chan, started Tommy Hackenberg, yeah. Chris Spieler. Mm, I miss yeah. those guys. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. I mean, that's just like the natural progression of any sport. You know, yeah. you know, people retire and then new people come in or just they get beat out and then they get cut from a team. It's the same thing, you're just getting cut from the games yeah, here. Yeah. So I think that you obviously, for, for those that are trying to make it, it's again, to kind of recap all of this, the, the first step to me is that assessment. It is looking at the data and making sure that they're able to do in a, in a long or a slow and like more long approach way 
do all the movements that they need to be able to do to hit the, the numbers like in a qualifier. And then after that, that's when you specialize a little bit more. Okay, what does movement speed look like? How do we combo these movements? How do we make sure that they're prepped and ready for competition? And then that's when you go and experience the competition, right? Like you have to have the psychological advantage of being out there and having that, you know, what yeah. you call callous, but like just building confidence and knowing like, I know what this feels like so that I'm more comfortable with it. Because if you don't, no matter how confident you are, if it's a new situation, it's really challenging to be able to, to ride to the top yeah um, other little things for athletes at the elite level I think to take into consideration is figuring out how to monetize it either as a personal trainer in the space that you're in as like a leader of your culture or as an Instagram social media I, like does play a big role because this sport is not super well funded at the top level that you should be planning that early on like if you're a young athlete that's 22 build a YouTube channel and start posting your workouts on there and also you could think about that as a cool experience five years from now, going back and watching some of your old videos, or if you do Especially become elite. at 22 or 23, you're, look, Cedric, who's yeah. 23 and is already would be classified as elite. Yeah. Have that YouTube library from 22 to 27, and at 27, look back at how much better you are yeah, than when you were, when you finally got onto the stage, and probably, yeah. you know, like, you made that transition, you're good. Yeah. It's and crazy people to see how much love people to go get. back and see it. So that way the YouTube channel actually has value if you do peak and hit the top level because people wanna see what you were like when you were 22 and 23 and what you were doing. So I think figuring out how to monetize it is super important. Figuring out how to enjoy it, which I think a lot of it is about having a peer group. I don't think a lot of people think about that in individual sports because it's so like, you know, I gotta be the best, I gotta do this. But having friends that you could lean on to see like, what'd you do on this test? How do you feel about this test? Like having a coach that you like that you could lean on when things get tough. I think that whole process is super important. I know TTT is kind of built a little bit of a, like a fraternity type feel, especially with some of the people that have been around for like, you know, how long have you been in the culture for like eight years now Something as athlete, like as coach, as content creator, like that whole process has, I think, helped given our whole community longevity. So I think when you're starting to come up in that process, think about not just what you're doing and what you want to accomplish, but who you want to be associated with in the journey, because I think it's important to have that culture to lean on as two, an elite athlete. Two things to add to that. Number one, training camps. I think one of the best things that we did last year, one of the reasons we had as much success at the games level as we did, were those actual competition prep Which maybe training we camps. won't ever have again. <laughs> yeah, we will. Yeah. No, I'm not going to into your pessimism. Yeah. Yeah. We will I'm going to do it and again. I'm going to lock people in six uh, foot. Yeah, we'll have like a park park boxes. Yeah. At some point, we will have training yeah. camps again. But I think that was one of the most, uh, it was by far the most successful season we've ever had. And I yeah. think if I had to like boil everything down to one, what was the yeah. biggest difference between previous years? It was just the success of that those prep, yeah. training camps. And then the other one I lost, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> One's good <laughs> enough. Fantastic. <laughs> That's the way to finish really this good one. Now I lost it. <laughs> You're going to remember it right when he cuts the yeah, camera. Of course. <laughs> All right. What other, do you have any good questions for us, Chris, behind it. the camera? For box step. <laughs> I was built to step on a box. All right.